Shalom, and thank you all for coming again to our uh, weekly lunch and learn here in IGTO Chicago. My name is Omer Eshel. I'm the Director, Council of Tourism for uh, the State of Israel in charge of the tourism in the Midwest region. Your host for today. I'm also a tour guide in Israel. And this is the third and final chapter of the Heating Jam series. Now, for those of you who came to the first and second, which I see it's most of you, and thank you so much for coming back again, uh, uh, this, uh, this series is now we're going to uh, focus on Jerusalem, or actually east of Jerusalem, Dead Sea, and the south part of Israel, the, uh, the Negev Desert. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to dive in. However, just remember, this is a completely informal uh, uh, lecture. If you have any questions while we speak, please, please do so. Um, also, just, just as a reminder, this presentation, the site and the order of the site is built like an itinerary. So feel free to take this and exactly the same as I give you the, 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 the headlines and the, and the summary of each site, feel free to use it in your own itinerary by this order. It's not alphabetical, it's, not, it's actually very much built like an itinerary, okay? Again, this presentation is from a viewpoint of a tour guide, not so much from a viewpoint of government, all right? So, let's dive in. Slide of Israel. This is the state of Israel. From north to south, we, I know we've said it before, I see people nodding, fine, but we're going to go through this again. From north to south is 365 miles, top to bottom. From east to west is about 50 miles. Again, one of the smallest countries in the world. Usually, if you're going to open any atlas, the word Israel is going to be actually in the Mediterranean, because the land is too small to even, to hold, even to hold the name. Uh, but it's one of the largest countries in the world in terms of geographical depth and history. You will find a lot of sight in such a small little country. The reason is because we are the only place in the world that connects three continents. Asia to the east, Africa to the south, and Europe to the north. So everybody went through Israel. From Abram, through the Mongols, all the way to General Allenby. Every single conqueror, every single trade, every everybody. So even the Homo sapiens and the, and the Neanderthals. But that's, if anyone is interested, that's in Hidden Gems chapter 1. This is just a fun slide of the best time to visit Israel. Our peak seasons are going to be in the summertime, during also the Jewish high holidays, which is usually around September and October, and uh, around uh, Pesach, the Jewish Easter. Best time to go is anywhere in the shoulder seasons, meaning from uh, the end of the high holidays up until give or take uh, Thanksgiving, even a little bit further up into Christmas, then from that period until Easter is going to be the low season, which is the best time to go, apart from the week of Christmas, by the way. Apart from the week of Christmas, the rest of, them, of that time is the best time to go in terms of hotel rates and flights. From Easter up till around mid-June, up to Pentecost, or Shavuot as we call it in Israel, it's going to be the shoulder season, and past that, that's high season. I'm not saying it's not nice to go there. It's great, but it's pretty hot. It's kind of like coming to Chicago today in the middle of a snowstorm. You guys are very brave to come, and thank you again for coming. So this is the, uh, 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 the slide of when is the best time to go to Israel. We have a little bit of temperatures. Just a side note. Continuing, we're going to focus today on the, on the two other lectures we spoke about the north, then the center, including Jerusalem, and today we're going to go along the, the Dead Sea all the way down to the south, which is called the Negev, the Negev Desert. Okay, Israel has two types of deserts. Actually, 66% of Israel is desert. Two types of desert. Anything from this line, about this line, the middle of the Dead Sea, downwards, meaning southwards, is a part of the global desert belt. The same of the Sahara Desert. It's the same one. Anything above and on the east, the east side of Israel, and above, north of the Dead Sea, it's what we call a shadow rain desert. You'll find the same actually in Nevada. Nevada in, in, in uh, Chicago, in, in the States, is a shadow rain desert. It's because all the rain that comes from the Mediterranean gets stuck in the main mountains, and by the time it arrives to the east, past the mountains, beyond the water divider uh, line, it actually, there's no more water in the, in, the, in the clouds. Imagine a sponge that's been drained, and then by the time it comes to the Jordan Valley, it's completely dry. Hence, Judean 
desert. That's why it's a desert. So we're going to speak today about the south, the desert area. Now, for the people that work a lot with faith-based, faith-based journeys usually end up around here, Be'er Sheva. Why? Because the Bible specifically says from Be'er Sheva to Dan. That's biblical Israel. What we're going to explore today is not so much biblical. There are some biblical sites, not as much. It's more historical and geological Israel. Okay? So a few biblical sites, not a lot. Let's look at the list of the sites we're going to look at. Remember, we just finished our last trip in Jerusalem. We are now stationed in Jerusalem. So good morning, everybody. We're going to go today on our tour to the south. And these are the list of the, of the, of the sites that we're about to see. Herodian, followed by the Byzantine monasteries, followed by Qumran, and Feshcha, and Gedi, Masada, and Bokek, Be'er Sheva, Arad, Avdat, I'm going to speak about wineries, Mamshid, which is a part of, of the complex of, of Avdat, Elat Mountains, Elat, Timna, Yotvata, and Il Ovot. Take a deep breath, it's going to be a long journey. All right? So, let's look at the sites themselves. We are now, as we said, in Jerusalem. We're going to head eastbound towards uh, 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 the Judean uh, desert, but we will stop in one of the coolest places in the world, right here, Herodium. Herodium, King Herod. This is Jerusalem. We're going to drive now to Herodium. Herodium is a castle that was built by King Herod, and it's actually a castle inside a mountain. Inside a mountain. When you think about it, Herod, Herod built the, uh, uh, he built his, uh, 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 this palace as a, pl as a place for his mausoleum to be. We found the tomb of Herod, the same Herod that condemned the Holy Family to be, to be killed. With the sa it's the same Herod from the massacre of the innocents. This is him. And we found his tomb, actually, if you look at the aerial view, right over here. This is the tomb of Herod. You can find his tomb today in the Israel Museum. This entire castle is actually a man-made mountain. So if you look from afar, well, that's, that's, that's a system, I'm going to speak of this in a, in a minute. If you look from afar, that's what it looks like. It looks like a pyramid that you do not see the castle inside. When you do go to Herodium, you're going to walk through a system of caves that were carved by the zealots in the, in the revolt against Rome in 132 to 135 AD huge water reservoirs that actually goes from, in the, from the belly of the ground up into the mountain itself. This is the mountain itself. This is inside the castle. Look at the size of the people. We're talking about a humongous castle. Anyone here saw the Lord of the Rings? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you remember the, 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 uh, the Battle of Helm's Keep? You remember there was this huge castle built into the rock? You remember that? Yeah. It's the same thing minus the orcs. So there's no orcs here, no goblins, but that's what it is. This is, this is Herodium. Seven minutes drive from Jerusalem. Not even seven minutes. Really worth your shot. Really does. Incredible place. That's how it looks like from, from an area view. One thing incredible. We're talking about a desert area. This, you see this, this uh, court with, with pillars? Yes. This is a Roman bathhouse. Look how big is the Roman bathhouse from the complex of, this, of the palace. Everyone here ever seen the movie uh, History of the World? You remember Mel Brooks' line? It's good to be the king. It's good to be the king. That's King Herod's palace. So from Herodium, I love this shot. Beautiful, beautiful picture. From Herodium, we're going to go to early Byzantine churches. Who were the Byzantines? Byzantines was actually Romans who converted to Christianity. So usually the date of Byzantine Empire dates from around 325 AD, then I see a committee, all the way to the hour, uh, uh, to the hour of conquest in 638 AD. Okay, so between that, those years, we have about, about 300 years of Byzantine domain. The church started here in Israel during the Byzantine era. The, founders, the founding fathers of the church, the established church, I'm not talking about the disciples right now, I'm not talking about Paul. The, the founding fathers of the institute of the church were people who dwelled in Laura. Now, what is a Laura? There are two types of Byzantine monasteries. Koinovium, which is living together, Koinovium, okay, Kovitea, living together, and Laura. Laura in ancient Greek means a path or illumination, okay? The first 
monks used to dwell in lauras. So they lived in small either huts or isolated caves with path that connects to the main church or to the main <laughs> JCC for that matter, right? So they, they connected to the main, to the main uh, uh, structure and that was the lawa, the path were the lawa. The other type is called novium, and which is for example like, like Aptimus. And this is where the, this is like the classic monastery that you'll find today. If you, if you look at the, any Benedictine monastery or Franciscan monastery, that's a Cornovium. All right? So you will find some of the most ancient Lawas still active. St. George and Malsaba are both very, very good examples of Lawas that were fortified because of Bedouins and because of Band-Aids. Okay? This is a Lawa. It looks like a Cornovium, but it is a Lawa. Actually, all the caves are being put together behind the wall. So two of the oldest monasteries in the world, St. George and Malsaba, those two, 1,500 years old. And you will find a few more uh, 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 very important monasteries. One is, is in Ma'alea Adumim called Martyrius. Martyrius was the Jerusalem Patriarch in the 4th century AD, one of the first Patriarchs. And Avtimus. Avtimus was one of the leading monks in the history of Christianity. And he built a humongous complex by the name, by the name Abtimus that has the largest, look at the size of people, has the largest underground water reservoir in the entire Judean desert. One flood can sustain the full monastery for almost 10 years. One flood. Open to the public, by the way. Next to it, not far from it, there's a place called the Good Samaritan. This is, according to the story of Jesus with the Good Samaritan, if you look at the layout of the land, when you, when you climb up from the uh, Jordan River up to Jerusalem, there's only one place which is a plateau. That's it. All the rest is uphill. That is the place where usually people used to stop. Okay? People were very, very, very tired after that long climb up. That is why it's called the Good Samaritan, because that's the only place where they got help and they could rest a little bit. Okay? Today, the Good Samaritan is a museum, beautiful museum, that built on the base of the church. You can conduct mass at the church, you can have communion in the church. It's a full Byzantine church. And it has a collection, the biggest collections of mosaic that are scattered from three monotheistic religions. Judaism, Samaritans, and Christianity. And you'll be able to see them in three different rooms, all of them from the Byzantine period. So we're talking about, again, uh, 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 mosaics which are at least 1,500 years old, if not more. Okay? So this is the Good Samaritan. From here, we're going to head down to the actual Jordan River. There are two places in Israel which are considered to be the baptismal place of Jesus by John. One is called Yaldanit. Check on chapter 1 of the Hidden Gems. This is, according to tradition, the place of John baptized Jesus. The other one is called Kassar el Yahud, which is a little bit north of the Dead Sea. Very important fact, my friends. Nowhere in the Bible it says the exact point where Jesus was baptized. So, Yaldanit is kosher, Kassar el Yahud is kosher. Not a problem. The early tradition find this place as the crossing point of Joshua with the 12 tribes. So what we see here is a continuance of a tradition. So the late, in the beginning, was, it was a holy site because of the crossing of the people of Israel. Later on, it became a holy site for the Byzantine for the exact same reason. Okay? So we do not know for a fact that this is the place of the baptism. We do not know that. But again, both sites, Yardanit and Kassar Yehud, kosher, fine. Usually, Kassar Yehud will going to be more for the Orthodox and for the Catholics even though many of them don't be baptized, and Yardinit will be more for the Evangelical and Protestant. Okay? Kind of like the Garden Tomb and Holy Sepulchre. Kind of. Continuing down, you will find the land of monasteries. You'll see a collection of monasteries that the base of them is Byzantine. Some of them have a crusader adding, and the top is 19th century. You will find chapels here for many different denominations, from the Assyrian Church, Greek Orthodox, Catholic, uh, uh, Armenian, Copt, all of them in the same area. What you see here is the procession of the Epiphany held by the Greek Orthodox Church. Okay, going down from the monastery of St. John, John the Baptist, heading down about a mile into the Jordan River. Okay? From there, we're going to go to Qumran. Any questions so far? Please, yeah. 
The Byzantine period went from what time to what time? Around 325 A.D., Nicaea Committee, to uh, uh, 638 A.D., the conquest of Israel by the Muslims. So in the museum you said there is um, relics from three major monotheistic religions right. that span 1,500 years. Right. What's that? More than 1,500 years. So okay. the peak of the Byzantine period was the 6th century A.D. That's Eudokia. That's the peak of the, the, the Yudokia was the name of an empress. We're not going to go into this. But she's the one who fortified Jerusalem. In her time, Christianity flourished at the, uh, at the Holy City. So most of the main artifacts you will find will be from the mid-6th century, meaning 540, 550 AD, of course AD. So that's the peak of the Byzantine uh, 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 period. After that, 614 is the occupation by the Persians. 30 years after that, boom, Muslim conquest, that's it. That's it, Christianity, of, of Christianity domain up until the Crusades. We're not gonna go to that, all right? So we are now in Qumran. Qumran is a prototype of a Laura. And this is the place, we remember, we spoke about Laura before, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the path, the main center, right, same thing. This is the place that influenced John the Baptist the most. And this is also the place where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now what's so important about the Dead Sea Scrolls is that there are about a thousand pieces of scrolls that held in them the oldest Bible in existence, which miraculously enough is exactly the same as the Bible that we have today. Exactly the same. Two things are different. They do not have the book of Esther, which we do. They don't have the book of Esther because for them it was a recent event. For us, it's 2,000 years ago. For them it was 150 years ago, recent event. The second, they have one psalm that we do not have. That is it, my friends. Everything else is exactly the same word for word. Now, what's so special about this place? The people who lived in Qumran knew Jesus. And they knew John the Baptist, personally. Because John the Baptist preached and ministered in the Judean desert next to the Jordan River. So keep that in mind when you go to Qumran. If you look at Qumran itself, by the way, in the chapters of the Bible comes to life, Check for uh, Yardenit, the episode of Yardenit. It speaks about Qumran as well. Why? Qumran has 13 ritual baths in an area that sees less than two inches of rain per year. John the Baptist tried to be a member of the Qumranites. We're not going to go into the Qumranites themselves. Again, if you're going to check the YouTube, you're going to find a full lecture about uh, Qumran. So <laughs> make sure to, to tune to that one. Uh, when John the Baptist tried to be a member of the Qumranites, after two years he left, and lo and behold, what is the first thing that he does? Baptizing people. Baptism comes from the Jewish ritual of mikveh, or ritual bath. When you're going to be here in the summertime, and I in the summertime, with the shoulder season, you'll see when it's about 100 degrees, we call it schwitzen. You'll be sweating horribly, and you would like to clean yourself. That's how baptism started to clean yourself, physically clean yourself. So if you want to understand the sacrament of uh, 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 that agreed upon every denomination in Christianity, where it comes from, one of those sacraments, right here in Qumran. Okay, question. So then when John baptizes Jesus, mm -hmm. that is after he's already been down Yeah. Qumran. Yeah, after he was influenced by the Qumranites, yeah. From Qumran, oh, right. What does Indiana Jones has to do with this? Let me tell you a small, well, call it kolios in Hebrew, a small story. In 1953, we found a copper scroll that speaks about a vast, huge treasure of the Qumranites. All right? So what happened was people were digging in the, it's open to the public, by the way. That, that, that scroll is open to the public. People were digging in the desert to find that hidden treasure. There was a gentleman by the name Vendel Jones in Israel. We used to call him in the National Park Authority, we called him Vandalism Jones. <laughs> Vendel Jones used to go and dig out the desert following the Copper Scroll. He found nothing, but one day a volunteer joined him. He was very impressed by this archaeologist by the name Jones, who was digging for a Jewish buried treasure. And he came to another gentleman by the name George Lucas, who came up with Indiana Jones. If you'll remember, the first Indiana Jones was Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's where it starts from. By the way, Jones did have this kind of hat. No whip, but he had the hat. <laughs> All right? So in a funny way, I can say that they did find the treasure of the Qumranites by the income of the tickets of the <laughs> chirology of Indiana Jones. Just a funny story about what, what, what is Qumran all about. From Qumran, you will find 
the, la the second largest oasis on the western shores of the, of the Dead Sea. It's called En Feshcha. It's the largest, one of the largest nature reserves we have in Israel. It's carved into three sec sections. Section number one is close to the public, and that's a biosphere for uh, uh, universities to study about behaviors of wild animals. You find all kind of wild animals from wild donkeys all the way down to tigers. The second middle part is open to the public. It's a piece of paradise. Beautiful, crystal clear water, nice, very shallow water. It's not, it's not even three feet deep. So if you have children on your group, great place to be. The third part is a semi-closed uh, 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 reservation. You can visit it with a ranger and you'll be able to see both worlds, okay? Gorgeous place to be, completely off the beaten track, completely, worth a shot. So that's in Feshra, I took that picture in 2002. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty nice, yeah. All right, from there, we will head down to En Gedi. En Gedi is the largest oasis on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. En Gedi also stands for the spring of the ibex. These are the ibex. In the 50s, there were maybe a few dozen ibex still alive in the area of Israel and Jordan. One of our biggest pride is that Israel brought to life all of those ibexes. Today is one of the most common uh, animal that we have in the desert. You'll find them anywhere in the desert. They are protected animals, but they're used to humans. So they'll, they'll come really, really, really close to you. Another animal that we have here is a hyrix. We call it Shafan Slaim. If you're going to translate to English, it's going to be rock bunny. Uh, Cute little animal, kind of like a beaver, minus the huge tail that dwells in the, uh, in the rocks. And of course, the story of, in Engedi, the story that we read in Samuel 1st, chapter 23 and 24, the, the encounter between David and Saul, that David cut the wing of the, of the, of the, uh, the sleeve of the coat of Saul. And it could have hit, killed him, but he didn't do that. Again, Bible come to life, watch the episode of Engedi. So if you have a, uh, a faith-based audience, especially evangelical, this is your place. It's a hike today, not a strenuous hike. You're not going to go climb the Everest, but it's not wheelchair accessible. So if you have group with uh, uh, some uh, difficulties, keep that in mind, all right? En Gedi. Right next to En Gedi is a huge, beautiful spa resort, which is the En Gedi Hot Springs. And uh, it's a five-star deluxe uh, 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 resort just across from the reservation. Question. Is the Ibex the national animal? Yes, it is. Okay. It's the national animal of Israel. It's also the symbol of the Israel National Park Authority. It's an Ibex with an oak tree around it. All right? Dead Sea. We're going to continue down driving from, uh, from uh, 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 En Gedi all the way down along the Dead Sea. Lowest place on Earth, it's uh, minus 410 meters, which will be about 1,300 feet below sea level. Saltest place on Earth also. 33% of the water is actually made out of salt. And it's the only place, one of the, well, yeah, it's the only place in the world where you can actually float and you cannot sink. All right? So that's the Dead Sea, Masada. Of course, we're not going to go to the story of Masada, but if you want to understand Israel, you need to go to Masada. No doubt about that. A magnificent castle built by King Herod, the last stronghold of the Jews for 2,000 years, up until the year of 73 AD. It took three years and almost 20,000 Romans to submit 1,000 Jews up here on the mountain. Incredible, incredible site. By the way, it's a UNESCO site also. So if you have people who like to gather the, you know, to mark in their passport that they've been here, 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 and here, that's a huge markup, huge one, Masada, okay? From Masada, across from, well, about 10 minutes drive, so yes, question. With Masada? Yeah. Can you, I've heard there's tours where you can go at, sun, uh, at sunrise. Yeah. Does the cable car run then, or is it that you have to walk, or how do you get up? Great question. Cable car starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. Sunrise is at 5 o'clock in the morning. So, you have two ways to climb up Masada to see the sunrise. The hard way and the short way, right? So the long way or the short way? The long way is going up through the snake path, which is actually on the opposite side. So you go from the opposite side from here, climbing up the mountain, it's about an hour walk. That's a schlep and a half. It is. It's a journey. It's not so much of a walk. It's a journey. Worth it, but it's a journey. If you want to make it much, much, much quicker, you can come to Masada on the other side. You see this white ramp? This is the Roman ramp. 
from top to bottom on the Roman, uh, uh, the Roman ramp is about 20 minutes, not even. So if you wanna, if you wanna s spare on your sweat, come from the west side of Masada, not the east side of Masada, okay? And you can do that, absolutely. Across from Masada in 10 minutes down to the south, we have Enbukek. Enbukek is uh, the main spa resort and hotel resort uh, a complex in Israel, of the, in the Dead Sea region. You're gonna find hotels from all different uh, vari variations, from three stars all the way to five stars and five stars deluxe, all offer magnificent pools, spa, the largest psoriasis clinic in the world is based, based right here in the Dead Sea. Queen Cleopatra, by the way, called the Dead Sea heaven and earth because it was known throughout the era for its, for its uh, therapeutic, uh, 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 um, what's what I'm looking for? Um, therapeutic. For its therapeutic healing. Yeah, thank you. Therapeutic healing. Thank you so much. Question? Yeah. When you talk about stars, mm -hmm. you mean based on the American sensibility as to what a three or four or five star might be? Is that what you mean? Good question. That? Usually, the Israeli system of stars is going to be more equivalent to the European. So, when our five-star hotels will be uh, the equivalent of about a four-star hotel in the states, usually that's going to be the case. Okay. Of course, your DMC will be able to explain to you much better than I can what is the what is the, the hotel that he sells you. But that's a uh, rule of thumb. That that's usually it. Of course, the mud, which is well known. You can find it in Marshalls today, you know, you can find mud in Marshalls. <laughs> How funny is that? All right, so the mud and of course float. By the way, guys, this is a great picture for someone to float in the Dead Sea. Don't bring a book with you, the ink will smear. <laughs> Another thing, don't shave before you go to the Dead Sea. <laughs> don't do that. That That's a full... Uh, no, don't do that. That's, yeah, no, no. If you if you had anything to remorse about, <laughs> you, you're clean now. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's the Dead Sea. From the Dead Sea, we're going to drive up to the west. We're going to go through Sodom, not the city of Sodom. We don't know where the city of Sodom is. It's called the Sodom Incline. We're going to go from Sodom all the way up to one of the most amazing castles in the world, I think. It's called Arad. Arad Castle is a biblical castle that dated from the time of Josiah. The one, this, what you see here is not reconstructed. This is a castle which is dated to the 6th century no, before, to the 7th century BCE. We're talking about, what, 2,700 years old castle, right? Inside, in the middle, you'll find something amazing. There is a small temple to the Hebrew God. Not to a demigod, to the Hebrew God. This temple was sealed, not destroyed, was respectfully buried. Why? If you open the good book, we're going to see the reformation of Josiah. Josiah, or as we call him Yoshiao in Hebrew, made this amazing reformation of gathering all the worshiping of God back to Jerusalem. This was the, board, the border of the kingdom of Judea. So what happened was that uh, uh, Josiah ordered to actually collect all the uh, uh, worshiping back into uh, Jerusalem, and that means to seal all the temples around in, in, the, in the land. And that's exactly what happened. We see here a ceiling of the temple, and you will see it. This temple is actually a miniature version of the temple in Jerusalem. Incredible, 3,000 years old, intact. Continuing from Arad, we're gonna to reach to the largest city in the south of Israel. It's called Be'er Sheva. It's, uh, uh, the city of Be'er Sheva is known in the Bible also in the book of Genesis. This is, this is the place where Abraham dug the wells. Okay, Be'er Sheva means seven wells, all right? All right, so uh, Be'er Sheva today is a city of about, uh, give or take half a million people. So we're talking about a large city. If you need a place to uh, relax and to have more of an urban uh, experience in the north part of the Negev Desert, this is gonna be your place. Right next to Be'er Sheva, you'll find Tel Sheva, all right? Tel Sheva is the ancient biblical city of Be'er Sheva, or one of the satellite cities of Be'er Sheva, another fortified city that was built by King Uzziah. All right, King Uzziah. In the Bible, we read about King Uzziah building towers in the desert and digging wells. This is it. You see this hole right over here? This is a water cistern dated to the time of Uzziah, and they harvest the water from floods. What year? 
Uzara is about 6th century BCE. Right? So one, one of the Jewish kings. Again, this Be'er Sheva was the southern frontier of the kingdom of, uh, 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 of Judea, in ancient biblical Israel. One of the most amazing, amazing things about uh, uh, Be'er Sheva, one of the largest cavalry assault against cannons in the First World War was right here in Be'er Sheva. There was a corp of, of military called the Anzac. Anzac, Australian, New Zealand corps. Okay? But they were uh, uh, a part of the British Army. They fought against the Ottoman Empire. And one of the largest battles ever, ever been fought in the First World War was with Allenby, General Allenby, against von Schli uh, uh, Schlissen, which, is the, which was the, the German uh, uh, general represent, representing the Ottoman Empire, right here in Beersheba. And today, if you have a group who is interested in uh, 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 biblical um, tourism or places of battles, one of the largest monuments of the First World War is actually in Israel. It's kind of amazing to think about it. When you, when you think First World War, you think about the Battle of the Somme, or you think about Gallipoli, or you think about places in Europe. No, actually one of the largest battles was right here in Be'er Sheva. Questions? All right, so from Be'er Sheva, we're going to continue down south to the city of Avdat. How many of you sell Petra as a destination? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. More than 20. Beautiful. What people don't seem to understand, Petra is just the treasury, just the place we call, in Arabic, they call the Khazane, that magnificent facade that everybody knows from Indiana Jones. The problem is, once you enter to that facade, to that place, there's no knight from the Third Crusade. And you will not find the eternal cup of Christ. It's just not there. It's a tomb. It's a tomb of a pagan king of the Nabataean kingdom. That's it. Petra was the capital of the Nabataean. However, the main domain of the Nabataean was right here in Avdat. So Avdat was the trade capital of the Nabataeans. Who were the Nabataeans? The Nabataeans were the lords of the desert. And they are the ones who actually controlled the final uh, piece of the Silk Road. That famous Silk Road that starts in China, goes through Arabia, and finishes up in Israel. That's the end of it. That part was very, very hard and harsh to go because it's a harsh desert. The Nabataeans were the lords of the desert. And they're the one, actually, who started to breed the, what we know today is the Arabian horse. Here it started. Avdat is the Tel Aviv of the Nabataeans. So if you compare that, for example, Av uh, Petra will be DC, and Avdat will be New York. Okay? If you want to understand Petra, you must visit Avdat. Question. How many people live there? It's very hard to tell. What you see here now is just the city center. Just This is not the city. This is the citadel, the churches, and the pagan shrines. The entire city is all around you, and it's carved into the rock. Same thing as Petra. Same thing, all right? So all these piles of rocks that you see here, all of this down here, it's all houses. This is all houses. This is what we call the Acropolis, the upper city of Avdat. What's amazing thing also about Avdat, it's one of the first nations to adopt Christianity. So you will see a pagan shrine that was converted to a church. And you will find bacterium, or a bath, ritual bathhouses to baptize people to Christianity in the shape of a cross, which is dated to the 7th century AD, and even before that, to the 6th century AD. So we're talking about 500 plus. Okay, as a nation, they turned, they, they became a Christian. Um, right next to Avdat, there is a place called Ain of Death, the spring of Avdat. Beautiful oasis. You're not allowed to drink or to get into the water because that's a safe haven for animals. Gorgeous place. And what you can do, you can park the car, park the bus at the bottom of the waterfall, climb it up, and the bus will pick you up on the other end. Gorgeous. And you'll find carved stones. They carved into the rock, and they were carved by the Byzantines 1,500 years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's under the Society for the Preservation of Nature. This is yes. So yes, and also very good. Uh, very good that you, you you reminded me of that. Again, is a UNESCO site. It's also a UNESCO site. Be'er Sheva also. All the biblical mounts in Israel, or we call them Tel, are UNESCO. Akko is UNESCO. 
the Baha'i Garden in Haifa is UNESCO, the walls of Jerusalem is UNESCO, and of course the Nabataean Kingdom is UNESCO. Okay? Continuing down, we will reach, for some reason this slide jumped up, but okay. In the ancient times when the Byzantine Emperor wants to brag about his wine, he used to open a bottle of Gaza wine. Nothing to do with the city of Gaza. The name of the port that the, the, the wine was shipped from was Gaza. It's the same as that you find Jaffa oranges. It's a brand name. They don't, they're not all made in Jaffa. So what happened was, those Nabataeans knew how to harvest the water that comes down in the desert and to grow vineyards and to make exquisite wine. The best wine in the Byzantine, in the Byzantine Empire, actually. What we did, we found in archaeological digs grains and seeds of those grapes, and we actually uh, genetically copied them. And the wine that you'll drink today in the Negev Desert is exactly the same wine as Gaza wine 1,700 years ago during the Byzantine period. Okay, so the wine that you have in the Negev is exquisite. Another thing you can use if you have more of a high end and smaller groups is the use of a tzimel. We spoke about that before in all other, other, other presentation. Tzimel, Z-I-M-M-E-R, tzimel. It's actually the Israeli version of Agriturismo in Italy. Small, beautiful, deluxe, I don't want to call it hot because it's not hot. It's uh, deluxe accommodations, what? usually. Hmm? Kind of like a bungalow, but much higher up, much higher. Usually it comes with a jacuzzi or your own small pool or something like that. Very nice, usually family owned. It's going to be in a farm, so you're going to have fresh uh, uh, cheeses. That area, by the way, is famous in Israel for its cheese. Very good. So cheese and wine, you're going to think you're in Tuscany or in Provence. No, you're in the Negev Desert, but that's how you're going to think like. So continuing, of course, the Bedouin hospitality. Again, I'm sorry for this slide. The Bedouin hospitality, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience for your groups. Speak with the DMC to go to one of the Bedouin tents and to, to hear stories about the Bedouins and about the customs of the Nomans in the desert. Really, really, really nice. Questions so far? All right, so from of that, we're going to drive to one, I think, one of God's best creations, the Ramon Crater. There are five natural craters in the world. Natural craters. Three in Israel, two in Sinai Peninsula. Okay? The two in the Sinai Peninsula, of course, today they are closed military zone. The three in Israel are open nature preserve, preserve uh, areas. The largest crater in the world is Ramon Crater. It's called Ramon because of the Roman Empire. They're the one who built the road that cross the Ramon Crater. Again, that road is a, part, is a part of the Silk Road. Of that, it's situated on the rim of the crater. The crater itself is 1,200 feet drop from top to bottom. You will see 80 million years of a geological window. Layers by layers by layers by layers by layers. Absolutely incredible. You'll be able to go, if you have kids in your group, these, are, these sands, we did not paint them. That's how it is. You'll find different deposits of different minerals hence the colors of the stone. Yellow will be sulfur, uh, uh, red will be iron, and so on and so forth. Blue will be, will be copper, and so on and so forth. So you'll be able to go, by the way, with bottles and fill them up. Completely legal, not a problem. Gorgeous place, okay? The color sands. One of the be most beautiful hotels in Israel is called Bereshit Hotel, or Genesis Hotel, and it's built on the rim of the crater. If you look at this endless pool, that's how the crater looks like. Or well, actually, even a better shot, this one. That's the crater in very, very early, very cold morning. I was freezing taking this, but <laughs> worth every, every second of it. Again, my friends, 1,200 feet drop from top to bottom. Yep. And is there a road that you walk on to get down there? Yeah, right here. See that? Mm -hmm. That's the road down here. See the, the bus down here? Mm -hmm. That's the color sense that we saw uh, a slide before. This is it. This is the parking lot for the for the for the for the sand. You can spend a week here, but the view itself that's <laughs> that's enough for itself. From there, we're going to head down to the Elat Mountains. Elat Mountains are extremely, extremely, extremely unique. Why? The Elat Mountains are four billion years old. It's the heart of the Earth. Why? What what happened here? This is actually pretty interesting. If you have a group who is, is interested in geology. This is paradise for them. Imagine the supercontinent of Pangaea. Right, that's what I say in English, Pangaea? Mm -hmm. 
Pangea. Before it splits, and we have we used to have what we call the Tethys Ocean. Okay, so imagine the Earth forming, and then you have a huge ocean cover this, and then you have sediments of limestone one on top of the other, top of the other, top of the other, and then you have Pangea started to break apart. What happened was that when the plates moved, they actually squeezed the, the, the crust of the Earth to come up. And when it came up, it brushed away the sediments. So you have rocks which are 4 billion years old next to rocks which are less than a billion years old. So we're talking about 3 billion years difference in a feet distance. Okay? And you'll be able to see all this in the Alat Mountains. This is an example of, of the layers that we just spoke about. By the way, the darker the layer is, the richer the area with wild animals because it has more deposits of minerals. Okay? The lighter it is, less minerals. Okay? I'll give you an example here. Well, this is the Lat Mountains, of course, the Lat uh, uh, Gulf. Look at this. This is the crust of the Earth. Okay? That's 4 billion years old. That's a billion years old. It's called the Millennium Settle. Okay? It's a very easy walk. If you have people who, it's about 10 minutes walk from the, from the bus, from the main highway. If you have people interested in that kind of, uh, kind of uh, 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 aspect of tourism, that is your place. Absolutely stunning, gorgeous Elat Mountains. From the Elat Mountains, we're going to reach the city of Elat, which is the largest city in the south of Israel, at the tip of Israel. It's our version of Miami and Vegas minus the, the gambling, give or take. So Elat is a place of restaurants, relax and relaxation. They actually have, you see, you see this structure here, it's called City of Kings. I don't know if I have another slide of it. Well, we have scuba diving, of course, swimming with dolphins. This is it. It's a theme park of stories of the Bible. Really cool. If you have, if you have groups with kids, wonderful place to visit. Uh, city of Elat, gorgeous, gorgeous city, great restaurants, great place to be. Timna. For many people today, they are not, they're not able to go and visit the hieroglyphs in Egypt because of the problems uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt and China Peninsula. Timna was the north border of the pharaohs, of the Egyptian empire. So you can find hieroglyphs, the same as you can find in Luxor, not as beautiful, but same period in Timna. Timna was the copper mines of Solomon. And until, up until the 50s, Israel actually excavated copper out of these mines. The geological uh, 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 structures you see here are kind of like the Mojave Desert and the Colorado Desert. Beautiful, beautiful geological structures. Beautiful. You have, you're going to see this, the mushroom, of course, like the... In, in, have you ever been to the uh, Alchers National Park in Utah? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> I'm the only non-American and I've been there. No. All right. So it, we have versions like the Alchers National Park in Utah. In Israel, of course, it's, it's in Timna. This is what I was talking about. These are hieroglyphs of the, uh, uh, the goddess of copper given a gift of, the, of copper to Ramesses III. Ramesses III was the son of Ramesses II, the son Ramesses that Moses gave him the ten plagues. So in a way, when you think about it, that's why maybe the Israelites took their 40 years in the desert. Why? If they would have entered through Sinai into Israel, they would go straight to the domains of the pharaohs, back to Egypt. You see what I'm saying? All right? So maybe that's the reason why it took them for so many years in order for them to wait for the Egyptian grip actually to lose sand a little bit. Yeah. And when you look at the bottom of, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of this cliff, this, go this, god by the name, this goddess name is Hatcho, the, go the goddess of copper, you'll see the Egyptian shrine being destroyed. And there's another layer of Midianites above it. Meaning, about the same time that the Israelites went into the Promised Land, the Egyptians were not there anymore. They were kicked out by the Midianites. Same guys from Jethro, by the way. Continuing, well, of course, that's, we, call, we call it the upside down screw. It does kind of look like a screw. So that's, that's Timna. Now, one of the most amazing hidden gems of Elat, free of charge, is the flamingo uh, salt pools. These are wild flamingos, my friend. These are wild flamingos. We don't breed them. We didn't bring them over for the tourists. The flamingos are resting here in what we call the, uh, 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 the, the salt pools that used to be uh, uh, for the salt factory. The flamingos are stopping over there on the way down to Africa and the way up to, to Europe. So you're able to drive with your bus 
and see wild packs of wild flamingos almost any given time of the year. Not so much in the summertime, in the winter you'll see abundance of them. Okay? Uh, from the Flamingo Sanctuary, we're going to go up to Yotvata. Yotvata is also mentioned in the Bible. And in Yotvata, we have a safari. It's not the Kalahari Desert, I know. And it's not, and it's not the savanna in Africa. But they have the biblical safari. They took every single animal in the Bible, minus the bears, because it'll be too hot for the bears, and they put them in a huge area of a sanctuary. So if you have a group that likes to see all the animals in the Bible, or most of the animals in the Bible, you can drive along in your Tvata and see them. So from hyenas to uh, uh, Karakal, it's a desert cat, to uh, ostriches, tigers, uh, foxes, wolves. This is called Re'em, so it's like wild, wild, wild uh, donkeys, uh, 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 the, 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 the ibexes, so it's You'll see most of the most of the animals in the Bible. Continuing up, you will come to some of the kibbutzim that can offer you very much of, of environmental friendly structures of hospitality. Okay, you can stay in a hotel which is completely environmental uh, 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 friendly, built out of mud, kind of like what they build in Peru, the adobe way of structures. Okay, or the baked or the baked uh, earth. Same thing. So it can be here in 120 degrees outside, and it's perfectly nice and cool inside. They are very, in Kibbutz Yahel and Ktoa, they are very famous for their watso treatment with the water. Very famous. Continue up if you have people who are interested in agriculture. How Israel is, is able to uh, actually push away the desert. It's a place called Idan. Idan on the north part of the Arava Reef. You can have guided tours over there in a road called the Peace Road, and we'll see amazing ways of agriculture that actually beats the desert. Continue from there, that's the last slide for today, it's called Ir Ovot. Ir Ovot was a trade post of the Nabataeans. Next to it, there is a huge tree which is called Sisyphus Christi. Sisyphus Christi is actually Sisyphus from the word pain or thorns in Christi, Christ. When you look at the tradition, that Jesus had the, the throne of, 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 of thorns, it came from this tree. Now, why am I showing you this tree? This tree is one of the oldest in the Middle East, and it's over 2,000 years old. So if you ever want to have a group to, that stop to see exactly the kind of tree that Jesus had his uh, 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 crown of thorns, this is it. That's a genuine, real, alive tree over 2,000 years old in the middle of the desert. And again, from these branches, they made the crown of thorns of Jesus. I think, yeah, that's about it. Any questions? Oh, come on. So as we're planning the itinerary, and we've gone through each, time, each section, how many days does it take for this part of the itinerary if we're planning? Well, What's the best timing in terms of how much should I allow? Well, if you're going to go to all the sides that we just showed today, that's a week. Okay. We're looking here in a week. What you can do actually, you can go to Siramon Crater, drive down to Elat, and then fly from Elat to Ben Gurion Airport, and then from there fly home back to the States. That will cost a, add a little bit more to the cost, but will save you about five and a half to six hour drive from Elat to, uh, uh, to Ben Gurion Airport. Yeah? And if you do that in a week, there's hotels periodically? Yeah, there's hotels in all the stations that I showed. There are hotels no more than 15 minutes drive away from them. So the main clusters of hotels you will find is going to be in the area of Matsada, of course the Dead Sea, in Be'er Sheva, in Ramon Crater. Most of them are going to be either the Hotel Bereshit or other or Genesis Hotel or other smaller hotels, and simmers, a lot of simmers. And the vast majority of hotels in the desert is going to be actually in Elat. Okay? Beautiful. Any other questions? All right. Cross the border to Jordan? Yes, great question. There are two, border, there are two uh, uh, crossing points in the center of Israel. One is called Allenby Bridge, which is actually very close to Qasar al Yahud, the, the, uh, the place of the baptism. The other one is called Arava uh, Crossing Point. It's a little bit, no, it's not so far from the, from the Flamingos. Mm -hmm. It's about 20 minutes north of Elat. All right, thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next uh, lecture of the Lunch and Learns. Thank you, and shalom in Israel.